left early because we had to go by CVS and Loris. And I said, hey, let's get, some, let's get one of those McDonald's caramel macchiato things. And I got one. And to mix it up, I usually blow in them. And it, well, I blew in it too hard. So I'm glad I'm behind the podium tonight. So that started my day, that started my evening. I'm like, but I was like, I, I don't get ill or upset at things like that. I'm just like, man, I got sticky hair and beard. And I need to keep something because we ain't had we ain't have anything. So and then she forgot my French fries, so we had to get some French fries. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I can tell you that it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um. <coughs> Are y'all ready to pick up with the quiz? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There will be some quizzical quizzes, but uh, <clears throat> no, we're gonna we're gonna do some study tonight. Um, we finished chapter twelve last week. Chapter thirteen is still part of that parenthesis we've been talking about. Okay, it's like a break. Because you had the seven seals that were opened. In the seventh seal, you had the seven trumpets. We've discussed that. And then when that seventh trumpet blew, we started this intermission period, this gap, as we call it, this parenthesis. And we've talked about uh, chapter 12, which was kind of like a brief history of the world, kind of with Israel and Satan. Um, so we've been, John's been, writing some scriptures that kind of fills us in on the background of things that are happening okay so from a chronological standpoint we're still at the seventh trumpet they're about to open up the bowls of wrath but in the meantime he's filling us in on some other additional information in chapter 13 we're going to read a lot more about this figure that we refer to as the Antichrist. And if you remember, maybe a couple months ago, we did a study, a separate study on the Antichrist. We talked, we, we, we went over the scriptures in Daniel and Isaiah and a few other places to talk about the Antichrist. Tonight, before we get into chapter 13, we need a refresher on the Antichrist because we're really going to be hitting the Antichrist really hard, okay? over the next couple of chapters. And the Antichrist is a key figure in the book of Revelation. And so I wanted to kind of give you a little more information on the Antichrist as well as what his job is, okay? He is the antagonist, okay? He is the, the opposing force, uh, you know, kind of like Satan is the opposing force. He is an opposing force. He tries to imitate Christ. And so, with that being said, a lot, of, a lot of what's going on in Revelation revolves around the Antichrist. The mark of the beast, the wars that are going to happen when the seals start opening it up, the first horseman, um, a lot, the false prophet is going to tell everybody that, hey, worship him. Uh, take his number, take his mark. And so a lot of things are going to revolve around him. He is going to lead. He's the one that's going to do the abomination of desolation in the temple at the three and a half year mark. Um, and then he's going to turn the heat on Israel. Okay. And he makes that peace covenant to start with. But we'll find out that he quickly uh, breaks that covenant. <clears throat> so with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that we can spend in your house of worship to study your word lord i pray that this knowledge that we gain lord will just keep it in our in our minds and in our hearts lord that we can tell others because lord i do believe that the time is near lord i believe we are right on the precipice of the rapture and so god tonight for lake swamp baptist church and those watching, Lord, I pray that you will protect us. Lord, that we are your children, that we are your bride. 
And Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just seal us until the day of redemption. For Lord, we do not want to be here when the tribulation begins. So God, please give us knowledge that we may pass it on to our children and our grandchildren, our co-workers and our families, Lord, to a lost and dying world. And Lord, let it make us knowledgeable of the things that are to come, Lord. Lord, let us take this word that we receive tonight and let it give us a hunger to study more, to learn more about it, and to get our eyes off of this world. And God, I just pray that all the study, all the discussions, Lord, you will receive as praise and worship. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now, the term Antichrist, who can tell me a little bit about it? Against Christ, okay. So it's a, so it's a term that says anyone that opposes Christ or, or does not accept Christ, right? And it also represents all of those that are false messiahs, you know. I don't know if y'all remember David Vern Koresh at Waco and some other characters throughout history. I'm the Messiah. No, you're not. But you see, there's one coming that's going to say, I'm the Messiah, and people are going to believe it, and he's going to deceive them. <clears throat> the term Antichrist appears four times in the Bible. Only four. One time it appears plural. So total between Antichrist and and antichrists five times. Now, you've got to be thinking, well, hold on now. The antichrist is a pretty central figure in the Bible. That's because we gave it a clumsy term. The antichrist. The individual. We have assigned it the antichrist. But nowhere does it actually refer to him. It's the spirit of being against Christ or a false messiah. Okay? So... You know, if someone out there in the world rejects Christ and will not believe in him, any atheist, any other, they are antichrists. Does that make sense? They're in the spirit of antichrist. Okay. Sure, anything, and yeah, it's antichrist or in the spirit of antichrist. That is correct. Now, it's only used by John. In his epistles, okay? Remember 1 John, 2 John? So it's only used by John in his epistles. And I find it interesting because who wrote the book of Revelation? John. But he doesn't use that phrase to identify this singular individual. So that's important to know. Uh, here's, here's four verses where these terms are used. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. And listen to the scriptures, okay? Listen for understanding, not necessarily to take notes or anything. If you want to write down scriptures, that's fine. But I want you to listen for understanding because we're learning about this figure, this individual. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is, the, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that is the last time. First John 2 and 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. First John 4 and 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is, in, is it in the world. Do you think we have the spirit of Antichrist in the world today? Just turn on your TV, right? And finally, Second John chapter 1, verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So there are your verses that actually contain the phrase antichrist. 
In John's letters, he wrote to combat the heresies and to discuss the preservation of the true doctrine. You see, there was this thing, and I've taught you on this, Gnosticism. You know, they were teaching these false doctrines. And so John was addressing some of the churches like, hey, those people teaching you false doctrines, that, those are antichrists. They are against Jesus. They don't believe he came here in the flesh. They think he was a, like it was only a spirit type being. His letters indicate a heresy was spreading throughout the community, which denied that Jesus was Christ and his coming in the flesh. Now, in the four Gospels, Jesus gives warning about following those who come proclaiming to be Christ. Jesus himself was saying, hey, there's going to come some that will say they are the Messiah or that they are Christ. Don't believe them. Don't believe them. False Christ and false prophets who possess the power to perform signs and wonders, as he said, would try to deceive people to prove their claim as the messianic figure. So in short, as far as the phrase Antichrist goes, because that's what we're talking about, it's basically anyone who rejects Christ or claims to be the Messiah, and they are not. Okay? Are we clear on the term Antichrist? All right, that horse is dead, right? Let's continue on. For our study, for our purposes, we're going to study on the Antichrist. Are you with me? Okay. And there's several labels and stuff for me. We'll get into that. But he is a central figure in the book of Revelation. So it's important that we understand more about him. Now, the idea of this individual, this man, is not only prophetical throughout the Bible, but it's also historical as we go back and we start looking all the way back in Genesis. Anybody want to take a gander at the first mention or prophetic instance of a coming antichrist of the antichrist anybody want to take a guess how about genesis chapter 3 verse 15 you remember that god is dishing out the judgment um, the curses and he told the Satan you know hey you'll crawl on your belly but he said this and, and it's kind of an interesting way to put the words but listen to this and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel now who is the seed of the woman Jesus, right? Throughout the Bible, it refer he's often titled as the seed of the woman. And many times when we read Genesis chapter th 3, we only think of the one seed, but there's two seeds mentioned. Who do you think the seed of the serpent is? You see? So that was the first kind of uh, foreshadowing of an individual, okay? That was like the first time. <coughs> now, as we're still in the book of Genesis, we kind of see the foretelling of Revelation and what's going to happen because as Noah and his sons got off the boat, God said, multiply, go replenish the earth and, and go. Well, they did. They started spreading out. But then what happened? What's that? Babel. Nimrod was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's make this easier. How about y'all form a little town here, and I'll form a little town here, and I'll form a little town here, and we'll work together. Stop spreading out. Let's, stay, let's make a kingdom, and I will rule over it. So we read about a people that were, were rebellious to God, and so instead of doing what God told them to do, they started consolidating power under a dictator in the land of Shinar, which was Nimrod and if you go back chapter 11 of Genesis it talks about how Nimrod became he was a mighty hunter before the Lord if you look at the original it's basically saying he began to rebel against the Lord okay he began to rebel he formed a godless confederate 
under his dictatorship. In Genesis 10, 8 through 10, we find Nimrod was the son of Cush, and he began to rebel against God. So if you want to write that scripture down, that's where you can read about Nimrod. Genesis chapter 10, 8 through 10. He solidified his power when he ruled over Babel and other cities in the land of Shinar. That's how we know it's Nimrod, okay? And we've talked about Nimrod quite a bit, right? The Assy he was an Assyrian. He created Babel. <coughs> and the word Nimrod actually means to rebel. Now, in the Bible, we read about two prominent cities. And they're kind of opposite of each other, right? All throughout the Bible, even in Revelation, even back in... Anybody want to take a guess at what those two main cities are in the Bible? Babylon and Jerusalem. They keep being repeated. It's like they're opposites. And they, they're, they're Babylon, how many times has it went against the, peop the, the, the people of God? Is Babylon referenced in Revelation? Yes, it is. We're going to start reading more about Babylon. Babylon is known as the city of man, if you want to look at it that way. Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem had its problems and stuff, the people, it was still known as the city of God. Okay, it was Zion. It was, it was his city. It was his people. It was their capital. Now, as you go on in history, the Assyrian Empire, which kind of consisted of the Fertile Crescent, on the eastern side where Abraham came from, Ur, Babel, all those places there in Iraq, modern day Iraq. And then he, remember, he went with all those kings, went around the Fertile Crescent and went down even all the way to Sodom and Gomorrah, which was, you know, in the Promised Land, all the way down to there. And then they got defeated. And we also discussed how when they were creating the Tower of Babel, God confused their languages and spread them out. He said, you're going to spread out. You're going to go. No more consolidating power. No more trying to overthrow God. No, stop doing that. And so Nimrod, we believe, actually became known by many different names, and we discussed a few of those previously. Even in Revelation, both Jerusalem and Babylon are prominent cities representing the two different forces at war. Now, in the book of Daniel, when we were studying it, what originated in Babylon? There was something that originated in Babylon, and it just kept being repackaged over and over and over into different cultures. Do you all remember what that was? False gods, polygamy, right? Polytheistic societies, false god worship, the unholy trinity. Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz. Osiris, Horus, Isis. I mean, there, it's like there's these unholy trinities, the godly figures, if you will, that just keep being repeated, the unholy trinity. You start seeing, instead of a cross, you're seeing an ankh with a little curve on the top, like it's a little handle or something. And so you start seeing this, and it spread from one culture to another culture. And so when the Romans took over from the Persians, who took over from... No, from the Greeks who took over from the Persians, who took over from the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they would just repackage the names. But it was still the God of fertility. It was, sti it was still the same stuff, just like we talked about with Christmas and some other things about how the Catholic took some of the pagan holidays, Saturnalia, and just repackaged it into Christian terms, okay? All right. So, Nimrod, so Babylon is not a good place. As we read it in the Bible, it's, they started consolidating, the people started to rebel, the, the Tower of Babel, not a good place, okay? Nebuchadnezzar, where did he come from? Babylon, right? That was the new name of it. Babylon, they started going after the people of Israel, God's chosen people. And so we keep seeing that as, as a negative city, if you will. Now, you're going to find out that one of the titles for the Antichrist, a lot of, a lot of, they call him the Assyrian, okay? And we'll, I'll read more about that in a minute. But he's known as the Assyrian. That's why a lot of people kind of think he's Nimrod the second, 
or in the spirit of Nimrod or a clone of Nimrod, whatever the case is, because uh, he was alive, then he was dead, and now he's back alive and or whatever. So there's some confusing stuff out there. I'm not trying to, to confuse you. We've talked about a lot of this. But because of Babylon being in Assyria and Nimrod was the first dictator in a kingdom trying to consolidate power and rebel against God, that form of government and their idea of rebelling is really what's going on in Revelation. Okay? So it's kind of the same thing just happening again. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Can all of that fall under the Antichrist spirit? They, John would have referred to them as Antichrist, yes. Yeah, because they, they rejected God. They rejected, they would reject Christ, correct. All right. Um, there are many Old Testament prophecies of the coming Antichrist, and we will discuss several of them whenever we're talking about the labels. So guess what's next? The labels of the Antichrist, Okay. Um, if you go back through the Bible and you read like, oh, it's the lawless one. That's the Antichrist. Oh, it's the Assyrian. That's the, you'll find over 20 different titles for the Antichrist. I encourage you to study to find them, but there are a few I wanted to refresh you on, okay? In Revelation 9, we learned that he was called Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in the Greek. Revelation 11, the beast. Revelation 13, the false prophet. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the lawless one. Also in 2 Thessalonians, man of sin, son of perdition. In Isaiah and in Micah, he was known as the Assyrian. Zechariah 11, the idol shepherd. And that's one of the only places you get a physical description with the eye and the arm. Daniel 7 and 8, the little horn. Remember that? Daniel chapter 9, the prince that shall come. Seed of the serpent in Genesis 3. And in Daniel chapter 11, the willful king. So those are some of the, the titles of the Antichrist. So... Um, as you're reading your Bible, if you hear those, it's the Antichrist, okay? Now, the Antichrist is a contrast, opposing force, opposite, if you will, of Jesus Christ. He tries to imitate Christ, okay? <clears throat> There's an interesting book out there called Dispensational Truth. It was written by Dr. Charles Larkin. And he took the time to go through the Bible, and he outlined the contrast between the Antichrist and Jesus Christ, okay? For example, and I wrote these down, Christ came from above, Antichrist comes from a pit. Christ came in the Father's name, Antichrist comes in his own name. And if y'all want the scriptures, I can give them to you. I didn't write them down, but... I have them. This all the scriptures are listed where this information came from. Christ humbled himself. The Antichrist exalts himself. Christ was despised. The Antichrist will be admired. Christ will be exalted. The Antichrist will be cast down to hell. Christ came to do the Father's will. Antichrist comes to do his own will. Christ came to save, Antichrist came to destroy. Christ is the good shepherd, Antichrist is the idle shepherd. Christ is the true vine, Antichrist is the vine of the earth. Christ is the truth, Antichrist is the lie. And you will find deception is his main weapon that he uses. Christ is the holy one, Antichrist is the lawless one. Christ is the man of sorrows. Antichrist is the man of sin. Christ is the son of God. Antichrist is the son of perdition. 
So those are just a few contrasts between the two. I found them interesting as I was reading and studying, and I'm like, you know what? I'll share those because Jesus is complete. First of all, Jesus and the Antichrist ain't even on the same level, so it's not a comparison of power. It's a comparison of titles, kind of, and their roles. Now, now that we know a little bit about the Antichrist, we did a study on him. We've talked about titles. We've talked about names. What's he going to be doing? What is his job? What is his mission? What role does he play? And so tonight, that's really what I wanted to kind of get into. So let's talk about his rise to power, okay? His rise to power. As we studied in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, the Antichrist will come on the scene in latter times and assume power by stealth and diplomacy. So he's going to be a politician, okay? He will not gain control by war, but by deceiving the world to the idea that he can offer peace. You see, he's not going to be Putin coming in with tanks and trying to take. That's not how he's going to work. He's going to be a man that says, hey, I can make peace with the world. I can unify the nations and we can make peace. Okay, and we learned about the first horseman, right? He come to conquer, right? And he's going to make war. Because once he gets those aligned kingdoms, 10, and he starts getting the power, then they're going to go and make this big war. Remember, and it leads to all that pestilence and famine, inflation, etc. So that's how his rise to power is going to be, is he's going to do it through deceitfulness and offer a peace. Daniel 8, verse 25 reads, And through his policy also, he shall cause craft, which means deceit, to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. What does that mean, he shall be broken without hand? He ain't going to be killed by people. It's going to be God. That's going to destroy him. That's what that means if you read that. Broken without hand. Now, let's talk about his one world government. Before we go there, what do y'all think? Could a one world government or a new world order happen? How? How would we get there? Right, right. So it is a lot of countries in the world, they come together, but why don't they do that now? All right, so United Nations, right? That's a lot of, that's a conglomeration of nations of like-mindedness, right? Fighting against socialism in Russia and stuff. And they come together to work together, right? So. Yeah, and a conglomeration of countries has more power than an individual country. Yes. They got to be able to control everything, right? How about money? Do you but what kind of money? See, a lot of people are saying cryptocurrency, right? Because right now what's the 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 world market is based on what? The dollar. Okay, the dollar, the dollar. Did you know that the dollar is losing value like every single day? Some people say the value of milk has gone up or the value of eggs has gone up. Not so. Not so. People still want eggs like they did 20 years ago. The change that difference is the dollar isn't worth as much anymore. So when you see inflation, it's that dollar is shrinking in value. And it takes more of it to buy those 12 eggs. Does that make sense? The European Union... They decided in about 2000, I think it was, maybe 2001, they switched from their own currencies, like the Deutsche Mark, the farthing, the, 
and they switched to the euro and they wanted one currency so that everybody's ears was like what what's going on here you know hey it's revelation but so they've already ex experimented a little bit with it right the dollar is backed by gold different things like that what's the bitcoin backed by can you even hold it blind leading the blind the one world government is predicted in the image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. Remember that golden image? Remember the ten toes, etc.? We talked about the different parts, the miry clay. The, the ten toes of the image represent the ten kings under the dominance of the Antichrist. The ten kings will come to the conclusion that they are incapable of governing themselves in peace with other nations and will give rise or will give their power to the Antichrist. Now, Pastor Dwayne, where are you getting that from? Where do you read that the ten kings are going to give their power? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're, at, you're asking. Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Listen to what it says. The King James Version, it's not as clear, but you can still make it out. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. What's power come in the form of? Armies, the economy, money, right? So they give it to the beast. And so that's what I was talking about, how they'll hand over their power and be submissive to the Antichrist. Not only will he have his one world government, he will also dominate the world's economy. <coughs> I already talked about them, him giving, them giving his power, their power to him. Um, I mean, how could you create a one world order without being in control of the currency, one currency? I mean... If we consolidated and gave all our power to one man, do you think we'd still have the dollar, the Deutschmark, the you know the euro, the? No, it it, it just it wouldn't make sense. You, that would like say go to Tabor City and have five different currencies to do things with. See that one world government's gonna be like, no, we need one currency, okay? And we talked about the European Union and the euro. His religion, what will his religion be? What will the Antichrist religion be? Because do you think he'll play a role in religion? Yes or no? How many thinks he, he will play a role in religion? How many think he will not play a role in religion? Well, Pastor Dwayne, you raised your hand for both. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. Because I know the answer. All right. Now, listen carefully. Li listen carefully to this because sometimes people speculate things or they come to opinions and a lot of times we don't understand how they do it so I want you to listen carefully the religion of the Antichrist is spelled out in Daniel chapter 11 and also in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 these scriptures teach he will exalt himself quote over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. He will be a master of a deceit, even in the religious realm. Even among religionists, okay? When we, re when we get to Revelation 17, we will study about the woman that rides the beast. Have you ever heard that phrase before? There was actually a book put out, um, A Woman Rides the Beast. Okay? And in that book, the author goes into identifying who that woman is, and he, he does not hold punches. So if you want an interesting read. Now, many scholars believe that this woman that rides the beast. Now, there's two women, right? One's Jerusalem, right? Not, not that woman, the other woman, okay, that rides the beast. She represents the ecumenical church. I know, that's a word I'd never heard of either. Ecu, 
What's that? Ecumenical. Ecumenical means representing a number of different Christian churches. So it's a conglomeration of Christian churches, if you will. Many believe the new one world government will not only have one economy, but also merge religions into one main religion. Hey, free will Baptists, aren't you Christians? Baptists, aren't you Christians? Lutherans, Presbyterians, aren't y'all Christians? You know what? The Vatican, they're Christians. They already have a form of government. They already have churches around the world. How about we just all consolidate into one gov one religion? Think about it. Think about it. But the Antichrist will use this new one world religion not because he believes in it but because it's going to help him. As a matter of fact, I believe he'll be kind of submissive to it. He'll offer peace to the world, and he'll start going through the motions. And he knows, you know, because think about it. The rapture happened. There's a lot of people like, whoa, this might be the rapture. You know, what, what's going on here? And be like, look, no, 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 no. Let's, let's come together. Because it's going to be, the rapture is going to be a significant event, people. It will be a significant event. But he's going to use this woman that rides the beast, this religion. He's going to use it and garner time until he consolidates his power and his aspiration to rule the world. Since the woman is riding the beast, many think this new religion will control the government power of the beast. In reality, the Antichrist will use this new religion as subterfuge until he can gather enough control and power to throw her off. So he's going to use this new religion, this new one world religion, until about the three and a half year mark. And he's going to be like, I don't need you no more. He will have enough power to say, I don't need you anymore. And we'll read more about that when we get to Revelation chapter 17. However, kind of to give you an idea, see here in Revelation 17 verse 5 if y'all will turn there with me please Revelation chapter 17 verse 5 or actually go to verse 4 and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color y'all know what the color of the uh, Vatican is Yep, scarlet. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written. Do you see that phrase after that? How many have it in all caps in their Bible? It was written that way by John. There's a key phrase in there that stood out to me. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Does, is it plural or singular? Plural. Harlots, right? And abominations of the earth. Do you know what a harlot is? It's someone that kind of tempts or uses somebody to kind of get what they want. A harlot. You know, like if you... If you go into a bar and a woman comes up, she's like, hey, how are you doing? You know, I'll sit with you. Why don't you get me this? Buy me a purse. Buy me a car. Hey. And she's just kind of using to justify her own means. That's a harlot. Now, religion is man-made. Okay, we've talked about this many times. Adam and Eve, when they try to cover their own sins by their own actions, that was the first act of religion. Harlotry would be, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and, but are you really? Or are you just going through the motions to get something you want? There are so many denominations of Christianity, it's shameful. Why can't we just use the Bible? 
as the solidifying, unifying bride of Christ for us. Why can't we just say we're Christians? We're Christians. You see, people will use religion for power, for money, to force people to do something because God said it. You see, they use it. The phrase I want you to look at was mother of harlots. Where did the Protestant Reformation originate from? That big church, right? And then all these other religions came from it. Who was the mother? Do you see what I'm getting at? A lot of times when you slow down and you read carefully, it's like, Study it for yourself, okay? And we'll talk more about that when we get to Revelation 17. Because you can go to some Christian religions and it don't take long at all. It, it doesn't take long at all before your hair starts to stand up and you're ready to get out at church. Jesus Christ said, Call no man father. Mm. Anyways, don't get me started on that because we'll be here next week. You're right. Now, so yes, he will use religion, but then he'll be like, I've been an atheist the whole time. I reject Christ. I reject all of it. I am God. He'll go into the three and a half year mark. He'll perform the abomination of desolation. And he will show them he has nothing to do with religion. And he will overthrow it. He will throw her off his back. His covenant with Israel, that's another thing he's got to do. Daniel 9, verse 27 reads, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, at the three and a half year mark, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's the abomination of desolation. He's, at a three and a half year mark, he's going to break that peace treaty with Israel. He will deceive them. He will turn them from God. He will do everything he can, but he's going to deceive them so they don't call on Christ. And at the three and a half year mark, that's when he breaks the covenant with them. Now, his death and resurrection. Wait, what? Did you say resurrection? I sure did. Remember, he tries to imitate Christ. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Are you paying attention? As we've already discussed, we know Satan will be cast out of heaven. Now that we've studied it, maybe around the midpoint of the tribulation. Many think that the Antichrist will die near the middle of the tribulation, at which point Satan will indwell the Antichrist and duplicate the resurrection. You see, they're thinking that the Antichrist is going to be this man. He comes in with peace, offerings of peace. He gets these kings, to, these nations to follow him. They go to war, all the, the four horsemen, the apocalypse, all that stuff, the inflation, the one world government, the one world currency, the one religion. And he starts going, and then at the three and a half year mark, that's when things really, really change. Okay? He breaks the peace covenant, he breaks all of it, and he obviously, from what it reads, dies. But then he is, and people will marvel at it. If that is the time that the devil, Satan, is denied access to heaven. See, he's going to be mad. And he'll know there's a time limit. And he's upset. So a lot of people think that Satan himself will go to that Antichrist body and dwell it and resurrect it. 
and now it's the spirit of Satan in him. He is empowered, like supercharged, empowered with miracles and powers, okay? That would make sense because in that verse we just read, see it says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. We knew that. And go into perdition, right? But then it says, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So it's like, whoa, he's back. Somehow he's back, okay? Hence he will come up out of perdition and again, try to imitate the supernatural work of Jesus Christ. He's trying to imitate Christ. <clears throat> if this is the way it happens, the empowered Antichrist will have the power to perform counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders outlined in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 through 12. Because he talks about these false powers and stuff he has. With these supernatural miracles, he will have absolute submissions by the world's nations. Now think about this. Imagine the world coming together after a, a, a mysterious event. Everybody raptured, right? All these people just... And then you have this man that says, hey... I can make peace because the world's in upheaval. It's in shambles. I, I can make peace. Even in the Middle East, I can make peace. And they're like, let's do it because his plan is sound. And he starts bringing the people together. And then he leads them to war against the really bad people that won't accept the new world order. And he conquers them. But because of it, there's millions dead. There's a lot of people dead, especially with um, natural disasters and stuff going on at the same time. So they'll form around him. And pestilence, inflation. His government's going to be the form of what? Socialism. Socialism. And he will start, that's where there'll be famine, etc. Now, he's got a lot of people behind him. He's, doing, he's using religion to kind of get there. But then at some point, he's going to die. Now imagine he comes back to life. But now he is supercharged. He is empowered by Satan. Supercharged. If we saw, see, we're used to common men like we see. We've never seen like a mutant, a superpower like you see on Marvel heroes or anything. Somebody that can, I don't know, heal somebody or, but this Antichrist will have power. What do you think all the nations of the world are going to do when they see an individual that can do that? We got the right man. He's the most powerful man in the world. Right. So he's going to try to imitate the Messiah. He's going to try to imitate the, the Christ. Okay. It is at this point he will unleash his attack on the nation of Israel. And it will be a holocaust like we have never seen before. He's broken the peace treaty with Israel. He is now in complete control. And he is supercharged. And his whole wrath and fury tor turns to Israel, God's chosen people. Because think about it. How many Christians are there? The Jews. Remember Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar? Invading Israel? You see... It's going to be an awful time for the Jews, especially when that halfway point, because that's when everything, that halfway point starts the great tribulation. The seven years is a tribulation period, but they call the last three and a half years the great tribulation. So with that, with that, in preparation for next week, I want to read chapter 13. I'm just going to read it. Knowing what you know now, okay, I want to read it, and then y'all prepare for it next Wednesday night, okay? Chapter 13 of Revelation. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. 
and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. How long is that? Three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. Questions? We've got some studying to do, huh? So you got the beast, and then you've got this other beast. You got the mark of the beast. So there's a lot going on there. Okay? A lot going on there. Remember, we're still in that parenthesis. We're still in that gap. He's just doing some background stuff, okay? So your trumpets, I'm sorry, your seals, your trumpets, your bowls, they're kind of chronological as they're happening. But within there, John's taking a break to kind of tell you some things that are going on, some some more detailed information. Now, let me ask you this. Why do you think God told us about the Antichrist? Why did he tell us about the Antichrist? What would have happened if we wouldn't have known that a man would have come on the scene, consolidated the world into power, if we wouldn't have known this? We would think he was God. We would think he was the Messiah returned. The very elect would be deceived. So the fact that God loved us enough to let us know, hey, world, this is what's coming. Don't believe it. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. 
All right. Any other questions before we close out? Any questions on the Antichrist? Something maybe you've heard or you've seen on a movie or you have a question about some, uh, you know, anything? Yes, ma'am. Because, so the question was, it's hard to believe that all these nations and leaders would accept him as the, the leader because it's right here in the Bible. <clears throat> How many people believe the Bible today? Yeah, so the, their familiarity with, with Christians. I mean, who in here knows a person today, if you went and spoke to them about the Bible and Christ, they may nod their head, but they're like, yeah, that's all fiction, and you're just, if it makes you feel good, you believe it, but I don't. You see, they, they do that. And then, even when, in the time of the seven years of tribulation, Christians are gone, prayers are gone. Do you think this is going to be around long? Think about it, and they'll be turned over to their reprobate minds. So Jews are the focus, okay? I mean, others will be brought in, but, but that's, that's, the, that's the point of it. So the, 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 to them, this is no different than Harry Potter. Our time is now. Yeah, our time is now. Right, our time is now. But, but during this tribulation, they're going to believe it. And here's another thing. Think about what you're seeing in the news. It's, I told you, they're called programs for a reason. When they want you to start believing a certain way or molding you to a certain way, they start talking about things. Okay? They start talking about things. Do you remember the first time we heard about uh, gay marriage? Boy, everybody about fell out their seats. No way, right? 90% of the people are against it. Blah, blah. What about today? What about the time we heard... Uh, that's not a girl. It's a, it's, it's a boy. Are you sure? It, so it, it, uh, but what about today? They're in sports. They're, I mean, they're, think about it. See, with enough programming, you can program the sheep to believe anything you want them to. You create a felt need for change. Don't they have rights? What about abortion? I mean, the majority of the United States is pro-abortion. So don't think that people can't program. What movies are we watching today at the, at the movies? Pay close attention to Hollywood. How many movies are about mutants and superhumans? So that when one really shows up, are we going to be that surprised? It only makes sense, right, with our advances in technology and bioengineering and, yeah. Yeah, you want to be, I mean, who doesn't want to be a mutant? Not this guy. I do not want to be a mutant. I do not want to be mixed. I don't want to be a hybrid. I don't, I don't want a superpower like that. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that, and there's terms that they will throw out to you. And here's another thing. How much education is going on in school? Is it, are you learning more about 2 plus 2 equals 4 and, and, and history, or are you learning more about treat everyone equally? Everybody can go to heaven. Everybody can be what they want to be. DEI education. See, everything is switching. Everything is switching. What's going on in the Middle East? I'll stand by Israel solid. I, I'll, I'll, I, I'm backing them up. I disagree with what they're doing. I, whoa, what happened? I thought you were supporting. Now you're, what, 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 what's going on here? It's heating up. It's heating up. How many people are protesting Israel in colleges today? You'd be surprised if you went on a college campus and saw how many people are calling for the annihilation of Israel. No, but, but the thing is, they haven't been. You take away education, 
You gain a dependency on government. You take away guns. Have y'all heard anything about people wanting to take away your right to bear arms? And now the people can't fight back. What do you have? Socialism. You're, you're, you're lining it up for that one world government. I mean, it's so clear. But if you are of a reprobate mind, you don't see it. You really honestly believe the lie. You believe the deception. You know? And if you try to sit down and discuss logically, kindly, you know, it won't happen. Yep. You wait. When you start, when, 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 when the majority starts becoming all these sinful things, and there's a certain group of people against their lifestyle, and, against, and, and then they'll say, this Bible calls for the death of these people. Look here in the Old Testament. It says if you have one of these type of people to kill them, to stone them, to, you know what? Y'all are terrorists. Y'all are terrorists. Your whole organization is a cult. Have you been hearing that word? Turn it to MSNB. A cult. Yeah. Yeah. If you yeah, the things we're being taught and programmed with it's but you know what? I'm knocking the I'm knocking the dust off my shoes. I'm knocking the I'm keeping my eye up there. All right, if everybody would please stand.